What's up, everybody? Welcome back. We have made it. UFC 300. And here are some DraftKings picks, best bets, FanDuel tips and strategies, everything you need to, one, have fun, two, enjoy the fights, and three, most importantly, make money at UFC 300. Welcome. I am Brian Jester, co-founder here at Occupy Fantasy. And I am joined by Jake the Snake, owner of MMADFS.com. Uh, Jake, with it being such a big event, I think most people would think that we have a lot of work that we had to do this week. But not many new newcomers, all known quantities. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but it felt like it was pretty smooth sailing all week from a content perspective. Yeah, speak for yourself. I felt like I was breaking <laughs> down 13 main events. <laughs> I guess that'll do it. So all these fighters have a million fights, except for a couple. Uh, but we'll talk about all of them here and now. So if you're new here, we normally get a, a lot of new people here uh, for big events you may be wondering, why should I be listening to these two guys? Great question. One, I've won the DraftKings GPP solo four separate times. That's over 600K in winnings. I also won the FanDuel one when they had the top prize at 50K, which seems so long ago. And I couldn't have done it without the help of Jake, who, again, runs MMADFS.com. He watches every single fight every week, goes back and looks at previous site, writes up every single fight from a betting and DFS perspective, invaluable contextual data to every single fight, and you can get all of his work at MMADFS.com. So that's why you should listen to us. And what we're going to do in this video, we're going to break down the fact that there are three main events. First of all, we'll talk about what that means for DFS. We'll talk about each individual main event, three of them, all three five-round fights. Uh, we'll play uh, good fighter, bad fighter, good matchup, bad matchup. Normally, we do this for fighters with less than four fights in the UFC. 26 fighters on the card. We only have two. We'll also break down Kayla Harrison, who is making her UFC debut, what type of fight we can expect from her. And then we'll close it out with our underdog fantasy pick and play of the slate a fight that you have to target in DFS, and our stream parlay of the week. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get into it. Jake, three five-rounders, pretty rare. I believe the last one like this that we had was 2021. What can you tell me about what we know about three five-round slates and how we should be approaching this, uh, especially from a tournament perspective, but also I guess also in double-ups and head-to-heads as well because typically we're looking to stack the five-rounder. Now we have three options to choose from. Yeah, man, it's been a while. So they did four of them in 2021, and then they stopped doing these, and they transitioned to just having two five-round fights on these pay-per-view cards in 2022 and 2023. Now they're bringing it back. You know, it's a massive card. They wanted to uh, have the BMF belt in addition to the two title fights. So we do have four slates to look at. They are a couple years old. Um, but, I mean, we can take a peek at them. It's a a pretty limited sample size. So, I mean, we have to be careful about some of the takeaways we pull from them. But on the bright side, two of them had unique winners. That's encouraging. Um, one of them had a 32-way split. Uh, it kind of shows us some of the things to avoid. They used the full salary. And I thought it was sort of interesting that of the four uh, different winning lineups, the one that had the massive split only included one five-round fighter in that winning lineup. So it just shows that leaving salary is probably more important than, uh, you know, maxing, doing a max one or, or some sort of extreme rule on the number of five round fighters you play. Um, another interesting thing is uh, just, I mean, it's, not, it's per usual, but making sure you get a couple low owned fighters in there. Um, the one that had the massive split, you know, it only had one low owned fighter and the two uniques had multiple low owned fighters. So, I mean, it just shows that those are the things you should be focusing on is leaving a little bit more salary, getting some low owned fighters in there, and then you can still play two or even even three one of the unique winners had three five round fighters in it so you can play three i would say two is probably the sweet spot in terms of not getting you know the more duplicated lineups the one that played three uh it left eight hundred dollars in salary and it had three low owned fighters so i think if you are going to play three five round fighters you really have to make a conscious effort to get unique with your lineup probably through a combination of multiple low owned fighters and leaving more salary whereas if you play just two five round fighters i don't think you have to be quite as extreme you know you can just play like two low owned guys and uh, you don't probably don't have to leave a crazy amount of salary so there's a lot of ways to get unique on these plates because we have six five round fighters to choose from um so i think you just have to be pretty conscious of the rules you're making or if you're hand building just you know making sure you don't just jam all the chalk because there is you know the strong potential if you hammer the chalk that you're gonna end up with a huge double digit split. And that's what we're trying to avoid here. You know, we're trying to make sure we avoid those negative BV lineups and we don't, you know, win, but then split it with a hundred people. 
Exactly. So lots of great points there. And uh, you mentioned low ownership and, and low owned fighters. For those of you watching this, if you have access to MMADFS.com or OccupyFantasy.com, you can have access to all the projected ownership for this slate. Uh, of the five round fights, Jay, I think only Yan Xiaonan is the one that qualifies as a low owned play, correct? Because I'm, I'm assuming both uh, Pereira and Hill, and I'm assuming both uh, definitely Gagey and Holloway, and obviously Zhang Wei Li. Uh, is, is Yan Xiaonan, does she qualify as low owned for this card? Yeah, for sure. I don't think many people are going to play her. So, yeah, if you want the one low-owned five-round fighter, it's definitely her. I mean, it's an uphill battle for her. It's definitely uh, definitely not going to be easy, but you never know. With female, you know, five-round fights, we see underdogs pull off upsets all the time. Crazier things have happened. Juliana Pena over Amanda Nunes. Uh, it's not insane to think that she could pull off the upset here, but uh, definitely a tough, really tough fight for her. And now for low-risk contests, for those of you who play head-to-heads, double-ups, 50-50s, these really small contests, we often see stacking the main event, the five-round fight, as a profitable strategy. Any other reason to stack Gagey, Holloway, play Zhang Wei Li? I'm not sure how you feel about the third or the, the, the actual main event with Pereira and Hill, but it seems to me stack Gagey and Holloway, play Zhang Wei Li. If you want to play one of the other guys, you can, but that seems like the go-to low-risk strategy for the slate, right? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you gotta, you, you have to play Whaley, obviously. You have to stack the Holloway Gagey fight. And then, you know, you have the Pereira Hill fight where the winner, yeah, they're probably gonna score, you know, 100 plus points, but the loser could very easily score like single digits. Um, there's a good chance we see an early knockout. So I think in low risk, I don't even see a reason to play either one of those guys, um, unless for some reason, you know, you felt like that the only way you could make your lineup work. But I, I really don't see a reason to play either one of them in low risk. Uh, and just to reiterate, you really only want to stack one fight. We see a lot of these cards with multiple five-round fights. Double stacking, where you stack one fight and you stack another fight, uh, generally has not been profitable. That doesn't change with three five-round fights on the card either. All right, let's get into these fights. And we'll start from the BMF belt all the way up. Gagey and Holloway seems to be the early favorite, maybe the only favorite, the only option for fight of the night, according to everyone on the internet, Jake, and especially with the 300K bonuses. But... Holloway moving up to 155 here for this fight. BMF belt is on the line. Holloway ranks higher in our model, especially on FanDuel. Uh, you get the higher floor, likely higher striking volume with Holloway. I'm curious to get your take on how this fight plays out. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because when you're looking at projections, uh, I don't think projections really know how to handle a guy moving up a weight class. They're looking at the stats that they've put up in the past and I mean, most people, you know, said, let alone projections, but most humans don't know how to handle like a guy moving up a weight class. Like, how do we, like, how do we make this into something that makes sense when we're trying to figure out numbers? And I mean, it's definitely a challenge because we have seen Holloway move up to 155 once in the past. He fought Dustin Poirier. It was on a little bit shorter notice. He got beat up in that fight. I mean, he didn't get finished. He went five rounds, but it was probably the most hurt we've ever seen Holloway. And he actually scored pretty decently, even in the loss. He scored 78 DraftKings points and 114 points on FanDuel in a loss. So it's easy to look at that and be like, okay, well, obviously, you know, if this goes the distance, like stacking could be in play based on how Holloway's cheap price tag. Or it doesn't even have to be a stack. A, a losing Holloway could end up in the winner just based on that. But at the same time, you look at Gagey, he's been in 15 fights in his career that were scheduled to go five rounds zero of them went the distance. So if we're saying that it has to go the distance for Holloway, you know, to be useful in a loss or a stack, it's not like great odds that it's going to go the distance just based on, you know, historical evidence. But Holloway's never been knocked out. Crazy durable. He's never going to quit on you. And he's a big 145. I mean, he's skinny, but he's the same height as Gagey. So it's not like he's, it's not, not necessarily like a Volk in Islam where one guy is significantly taller than the other. It's just, Gage is more filled out than Holloway. Holloway had a little bit more time to put on muscle, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's still going to move back down to 145 after this. So it's, it's not like he took a year off and really bulked up. I mean, he just, he put on a little bit of weight. He put on more weight than he did in the Poirier fight, I would say. Um, but obviously, ignoring the whole weight thing, you know, Max owns all the records for landing the most strikes in UFC history, the top two for most strikes in a fight, the most strikes in a career. I mean, just crazy, absolute crazy volume. And Justin Gagey averages 7.50 significant strikes absorbed per minute, most on the slate. So, of course, projection systems are going to be like, okay, Max Holloway has the potential to land 400 significant strikes here. 
and score an absolute, you know, a million points at his cheap price tag. And that's why he's going to be the most popular underdog on the slate. And it all makes sense. I mean, if, if that happens, he's going to go crazy and he's got massive scoring potential and he's never been knocked out. So you have to like his floor, but you know, Gagey is probably one of the most destructive humans on the planet when you lock him in a cage and who knows how this is going to go. I think that we've seen Holloway's lead leg get beat up in the past, uh, most notably in that bulk fight. Gagey has nasty leg kicks. If he really tears up Holloway's leg, is Holloway going to be able to move around as well and land as many strikes? Or is he going to be kind of a sitting duck there for Gagey to tee off on? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting points. Can Gagey keep up the pace with Holloway? I mean, there's really a ton to look at in this fight. And I mean, it's pretty fascinating in the ways you can approach it because I, I get all the arguments for liking either guy, for liking both guys. I mean, we have seen Gagey bust a few times, um, you know, typically kind of like poorly timed finishes. And I will say if that happens again, like an er- another early second round knockout or something, like he could potentially, you know, eliminate 85% of the field from winning tournaments, which, I mean, it's it's hard not to put one of these guys or even both in your lineups. But if somehow the fight gets left out, it's just absolutely insane leverage in tournaments on a slate where it's really hard or at least harder to get unique, you know, unless you're going to, you know, you can do that or you can play a bunch of low owned guys. I mean, there's different approaches you can take, but that is one tournament approach is saying, I'm going to build some lineups without either one of these two, because I know if somehow, I mean, there's always ways that we're not thinking of, you know, it could be an eye poke. It could be a no contest, poorly timed finish, like all sorts of random, you know, freak injuries, all sorts of ways that fights can bust that most people are saying this fight can't bust. You know, like that's just that's just how it goes. So I think you do probably want to be over the field on on in terms of like underweight on the fight as a whole, I guess you would say. Like if the field's gonna have eighty five percent, maybe you have seventy five percent. Just a few more lineups that don't don't assume the obvious um with this fight. But I do think it's gonna be a great fight, like everyone else. And I do think the winner's probably gonna score well, but you know, it's kind of embrace the chaos type of thing here. Exactly, and that's for large field tournaments, right? Where we're looking to find the optimal, and if 85% of the field busts or just doesn't have the optimal version of the lineup, the top lineup, uh, then you gain a huge edge there. Now, if you're playing small field contests, you're playing three max, just play two of these guys in, in, in two lineups, and the other, uh, play one guy in two of your lineups, play the other one in one. If you're playing single entry, pick one of these guys. You don't have to get the optimal in those lineups. So just get the highest likelihood outcome by playing one piece of this fight in those lineups. Large field be a little more cautious because again, while we have 200k up top, it is a $30 entry fee, and uh, you can quickly get over a lot of the field if somehow this fight is not optimal. So let's keep that in mind. And this fight, I think, is a great example, Jake, of on this card where we have so many known quantities, the odds of it being such a good watch compared to how it turns out in DFS and maybe even betting. This fight alone highlights that where it's likely to be a great fight to watch. It's also likely to match its ownership and also make it like uh, really hard to get different in tournaments. So when you have so many known quantities, a lot of times the ownership does follow the best plays. So yeah, it's going to be from start to finish, going to be a great fight, a uh, great card to watch. But typically we've seen these types of, of cards, Jake. It's, it's really difficult to get different without being too crazy. It is, man. It's definitely, and it's easy to get too crazy too. Like, you know, you can talk yourself into a lot of things. Um, So yeah, I mean, I agree. Totally tons of upside, but definitely think about the ways it could bust when you're building tournament lineups. Um, What what is your take on on a stack here in in tournaments? Like that's going to be a little bit more popular than normal, right? I would think so, right? I think some of the numbers you show is 1% to 3% of people stack the main event in tournaments. And when we have these types of fights, I think Islam, Volk qualifies as well. That obviously went up in flames, but I think it was 3 to 5%. So it does get increased. People note it. So I, I wouldn't be shocked that this ends up in that 3 to 5% range of lineups in large field tournaments that do it. Uh, it does differentiate your lineup a little bit, obviously, as not many people are stacking. Uh, you still have to include low-owned elements like leaving salary, like um, uh, like including low-owned fighters. But on a fight on a card where it's really hard to get different, I don't mind that as one of the ways. Yes, 13 fights is not ideal to do something like that. But a fi- uh, on a card where we have likely pretty locked-in money lines, we should have some competitive fights. But it, we could see a slate where two dogs win, three dogs win. And if that's the case, Holloway, in a loss, 
which would have to happen. He would have to to lose that fight. He can't beat Gagey, and that stack would work. But I think it could happen. Right, yeah. I mean, he would have to lose a decision, and it would have to be like a max of one other two underdogs winning. I know people are going to ask the question, which is why I brought it up. And normally, I'm opposed to stacking whatsoever. But if people were ever going to do it, this is a spot. But if lots of people are doing it, then you don't want to do it. So, yeah. you know, it's one of those things. Yeah, good luck figuring that out. All right, moving on. Let's talk about <laughs> uh, the women's title on the line, Zhang Wei Li, and let's sort by fights here, and Yan Xiao Nan. Wei Li, one of the biggest favorites on the card, probably would be the biggest favorite if not for uh, Bo Nickel and his minus two billion money line. Uh, we can keep this brief, Jake. How does Yan Xiaonan win this fight? Spoil the Zhang Wei Li fifty percent ownership in tournaments. Yeah, I mean, she's a striker, so I think she would have to knock her out. Yan has one finish since 2016 not super encouraging um it was in her last fight against jessica and who was cutting an additional 10 pounds to move from 125 to 115 but you know we saw way lee get knocked out by rose with the head kick crazy things can happen but i sort of think that's the only way you know like a fluky knockout i don't see her outclassing her for five rounds i mean jan's a good striker but we saw her get finished on the mat by carla esparza and i know that was before she moved to Team Alpha Male, and her wrestling may have gotten better since then, but if you're getting finished by Carla Esparza on the mat, then, I mean, good luck against Whaley. <laughs> I think that's fair. So the question is, if we assume what is likely to happen, Zhang Whaley, uh, if you read the Daily Plug at Occupy Fantasy or Jake's write-ups at MMADFS.com, just highlights how ridiculous her scoring ceiling truly is in a win outside of the one random Esparza sub two fights ago. So how do we handle her, Jake? She seems like a, a fighter we can just lock into most types of lineups, smaller lineups, large field. What do we do with that? Do we match the 50%? Do we exceed it? Or uh, do we hope for an ill-time finish or a random upset? I guess a lot of that depends on your risk tolerance because it is one of those spots where, like, unless something completely random or terrible happens, and, I mean, she just has, like, an absolutely insane ceiling that she showed in her last fight where she scored 191 <laughs> DraftKings points and 166 points on FanDuel. I mean, just absolutely craziness. But we have seen, you know, poorly timed submissions where she could score, you know, 90, 95 points and get left out in that situation. But it's a, it's a, it's a thin line, you know, that's a tough needle to thread right there. So I, I don't know. I mean, what what are you doing with her? When you have a 50% fighter, I don't think there's a ton to be gained by being way over. Um, okay. So I guess you sort of match, unless you want to get really crazy and be under. But, I mean, what are you doing? Typically, and again, this goes to where your risk tolerant comes in, I'm almost always going to be underweight on a 50% fighter, especially when we have someone like Bo Nickel at the top, who is a real chance of a quick win bonus. He's done it once already. Real chance of a first-round finish. Harrison, who we'll talk about here in a second, massive takedown, control time, ground strike, early finish potential. Gets a little trickier after that. But there are at least some options that can outscore her, even if she – obviously, she can't go off for 150 or 190 or whatever. But, you know, second-round finish, 114, early first-round finish, you know, 110. She could possibly be outscored there. And I think you just – Playing 50% owned fighters is really hard to win GPPs. Is, and that's why this slate is so difficult, because she is worthy of that 50% ownership. Yeah, I mean, she really is. It's definitely a hard spot. <laughs> All right, so moving on. Let's talk about the uh, the main event, the main, 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 main event. Super excited for this fight. Pereira and Jamal Hill. Uh, let's put them in here. All right. Uh, Alex Pereira, small favorite. Hill coming off the Achilles injury. I imagine we'll see a striking battle. Hill, I assume, would have the grappling upside. Not sure he'll even attempt to take down, as he rarely does. So, uh, Jake, it seems like the story is probably the Achilles injury. How comfortable and fully healed is Jamal Hill? Two guys going to be striking for however long it lasts, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, he's only nine months removed from the ruptured Achilles. I think that's kind of like the normal recovery time, but in terms of getting back to fighting in a world title fight, uh, you know, I don't know if there's anything normal about that. So it's pretty crazy that he's back already. Uh, I think it was in July that it happened. He was playing basketball and like during international fight week, ruptured his Achilles, vacated the belt. 
now coming back around for it. Um, yeah, he's never attempted a takedown in the UFC. So, like, theoretically, that's the way you attack Alex Pereira. But I don't think he's going to do it. I think he's going to try to knock him out. And I think he can. I mean, Pereira has been kind of chinny. Maybe his durability is a little bit better now that he's not cutting as much weight. But I don't know, man. Uh, both guys hit hard. I think it really just comes down to the difference in durability between the two. And I see Hill as being a little bit more more durable. I mean, Pereira is the more technical kickboxer, but definitely should be a fun fight, high stakes striking battle, and it should stay on the feet unless we get some surprise wrestling from Hill, which I mean, I don't really think is going to happen, but it would be smart for him to do this. Rarely do fighters, and again, if you're in the business of fighting, ego plays a big part. Rarely do fighters against Alex Pereira go with the path of least resistance. They want to say, I'm going to see if I can strike with the best strike in the world. Oftentimes, we see how that turns out. I would not expect this to be any different. And this is just another example of this card being, I cannot wait to see what happens here. If you had to pick one for your single entry, good luck. Flip a coin. Our model likes Hill a little bit better. He could easily score five points. Same for Pareto. Three max. Probably play one and one. Fade the other. I will say... I'll ask you what the projected ownership in, in uh, total is for this fight in large field GPPs. feels like the easiest one to leave out where second round finish, probably not a first round finish, but second or third round finish could easily leave this fight out of the optimal. Yeah, especially if it's Pereira because he's a little bit lower volume and a little bit more expensive. Um, you know, if I'm looking to fade one of the five round fighters, like one of the popular five round fighters, not counting Jan, it's definitely Pereira here. Like I just, I think Hill should be a slight favorite instead of Pereira. I mean, obviously, we have some uncertainty with the injury that could change things. Like, maybe Hill will not look like the same guy he was before injury. But I don't know. If you're going to take a stand, I mean, I, that's the guy I'm looking to be underweight on is Pereira and be overweight on uh, Hill here. I think that's fair. That is totally fair. So, all right, those are the three five-round fights. If you guys have additional questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments below. We will happily answer them. And uh, if you want in-depth discussion, in-depth answers, you can join our Discord server, occupyfantasy.com slash Discord. So that link is also in the description. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> let's talk about Kayla Harrison. She's the one fighter making her first walk to the UFC octagon. Obviously highly touted. Has the one loss on her record in a five-round decision loss in the PFL. <clears throat> if you go out and watch her Invicta fight, the last time she was allowed to use elbows, essentially murdered a woman in the cage. And... Uh, Incredible DFS upside now at $9,300, sandwiched between Jan, uh, uh, Zhang Wei Li and Bo Nickel. Don't expect her to be too popular, uh, but Jake, talk to me about her upside, her fighting style, and how you think she matches up with Holly Holm. Yeah, I mean, her fighting style looks great for DFS. You know, 33 year old, 16 and 1, 12 finishes, um, two gold medals in the Olympics for judo, great wrestling, great ground and pound, great submissions, really big. Uh, this is our first fight ever. So the biggest <laughs> really question big. mark is first, She's huge. <laughs> really big. First fight ever at 135 pounds in her entire career. She's been fighting basically her entire career at 155. She had that one Invicta fight that was at 145. Her last fight against Aspen Ladd was at the 150 pound catch weight. And she was actually scheduled to fight at 145 there and then got a late opponent change. So I think she was preparing to make the move down because she. I mean, the writing was on the wall with kind of the merger. And I think she wanted to get to the UFC. She knew there was no one. Obviously, there was no 155-pound division. They were getting rid of the 145-pound division. So you got to work your way down to 135. And no one believed that she could do it. And today she weighed in at 136 pounds and made the made weight. I mean, she would, didn't die on the scale. Or at least didn't seem like she did. Um, so, I mean, I see a lot of upside with her, man. If you watch any of her fights, I mean, it's hard not to see the upside. She's just killing people on the mat with ground and pound and submissions. I mean, massive upside. It's not the easiest matchup here. Home has a pretty good takedown defense, hard to hold down, but 42 years old. I mean, at some point, like the wheels are going to fall off and this could be the spot, you know, they're trying to build up contenders at 135, and I don't think they're trying to build up home here. You know, they're trying to build up Harrison to fight Pennington maybe even bring Nunes out of retirement. You know, home is just the name that they use to to build up the contenders, whether it's Bueno Silva, uh, Kayla Harrison. Like, she looks legit, man. Uh, she just needs to, hopefully the weight cut doesn't kill her to the point that, you know, her durability or cardio are affected in the fight. But it does look like she has a ton of potential. And, uh, yeah, I think she's going to be able to get this fight to the mat. 
and uh, do some damage here. And one thing about projections, I know a model is picking up on this or has picked up on this, or if you look at someone's stats and home has a great takedown defense, that could obviously it's not going to look great in projections if she can defend a lot of Kayla Harrison's takedowns. Obviously, this fight completely changes. But if Harrison has success and home is returning quickly, that's how you end up with six, seven, eight, nine, ten takedowns in a fight when the other person is not content with just staying on their back. And that's how you get massive scores. And that's how potentially, Jake, you could get a 20 to 25 percent owned Kayla Harrison outscoring Zhang Weili. Potentially. No, I mean, that's a, that's a great point, man. Chain wrestling, I think, is very live here because home is good at getting back to her feet when she gets taken down. And we could definitely see Harrison just rack up takedowns. Absolutely. All right. So now, typically, we play good fighter, bad fighter, good matchup, bad matchup. Give more context to the fighters who have less than four fights in the UFC. Seeing this as this is UFC 300, every fighter has a combined 600 fights. There are only two uh, on this card. Uh, Diego Lopez is the first one who burst onto the scene, nearly upset uh, Evloyev, then completely destroyed Gavin Tucker and Pat Sabatini. Now he's a favorite here against Sadiq Youssef. So we'll keep this brief, Jake. Is Lopez good or bad? And this is a, such a fine line for DFS. Uh, there are a lot of fighters like this. And uh, is this a good or bad matchup against Sadiq Youssef? I think he's pretty good. I think he has holes in his game that haven't been exposed yet in the UFC, but I think it's a bad matchup for Yusuf, despite Yusuf only having a 62% takedown defense on paper. I think the thing people probably aren't realizing is that Lopez never looks to wrestle. He looks to grapple. He doesn't look to wrestle. He doesn't look to take people down. He, he waits till fights end up on the mat or till people take him down. And then he's like a jujitsu wizard, but he's not really looking to wrestle much. He's, he's low volume. I mean, there's a reason that he's what two and four in decisions. Um, He's a good finisher, but that's kind of his limitations. And we and we haven't seen that yet in the UFC because he almost, you know, he came into the UFC and almost pulled off that crazy upset with multiple submission attempts in his debut against Iglov. And then he gets back-to-back first-round finishes where it's like, oh, man, this guy's so good. But, like, there are going to be some warts on his game that I think get exposed. And Yusuf is – I know he's coming off the loss to Barboza, but Yusuf is good, man. Um, I think Yusuf can – has a good chance at exposing – Lopez here and uh and probably winning decision. I mean maybe knocking him out, but I think a decision is a little bit more likely. Lopez and even Charles Oliveira to an extent, they're never gonna look good, at least in our projections. I don't know how other people do projections. I assume they're gonna look good in those because they're tied to the betting markets and Lopez has a decent chance of finishing Yusuf, at least according to the inside the distance numbers. Same for Oliveira being an underdog. But if they are not finishing, Jake, they're likely not going to be useful for DFS. You look at Lopez, just despite all the the crazy theatrics, submission attempts, crazy moments in his debut, scored 23 points in a three-round decision. Oliver is the same way, not act, usually actively looking to wrestle, at least in his later years, content with grappling. These guys like Lopez, these guys like Oliveira, if they're not going to finish, it, they are almost, in a sense, round one or sub, uh, KO or sub bust because they're not going to put up a ton of counting stats behind it. Right. There's not takedowns. There's not striking. It's just like, yeah, it's a bunch of flashy grappling where they're looking for submissions. But, you know, A, submission attempts don't score anything on DraftKings. And B, it's hard to even get an official submission attempt. Looking for a submission does not get you an official submission attempt. True. That's very true. That is very true. So, like, while it sounds crazy because they're two completely different fighters, someone like Yuri Prohaska and Diego Lopez are in similar veins that if they're not getting an early finish, they're going to be pretty much useless for your lineups, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm always saying. Diego Lopez and Yuri Prochaska, same guy. <laughs> that's why everyone tuned in for this show for these types of comparisons. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the fight that you have to target in DFS, our underdog fantasy pick em slip of the week, and our stream parlay of the slate. Before you do that, again, make sure you check out Jake's site, MMADFS.com, for the sheet where he breaks down every single fight from a betting and DFS perspective, his uh, premium content, most importantly, where you can get the early access to his bets earlier in the week. Often those odds change. He's always talking about and bragging, I would say. I got it at this number. Now it's available at this number. If you want to be with Jake and brag about the closing line value and get those certificates sent to you in the mail every time you beat the closing number, Get on Jake's premium content at MMADFS.com. He comes over and writes the daily plug, OccupyFantasy.com on Fridays. Top plays for DFS, favorite remaining bets, most importantly, lineup construction tips for DraftKings and FanDuel, and then our model that we've been talking about with projected ownership and our lineup builder that allows you to build with 300 lineups. 
Yes, we understand that many of you just watching this content for free. We super appreciate it. But if you want that extra edge, make sure you check out our sites. Uh, and on that note, if you like what you've seen so far, make sure you click that subscribe button below. That is the free and best way to support us here. It allows us to continue to make these videos. So click subscribe, get notified when we go live and upload these UFC videos every week. Give us a thumbs up. That's actually the easiest, freest way to support the videos. So moving on, Jake. Underdog Fantasy. You guys see the promo code if you haven't signed up already. Promo code Occupy gets you a 100% deposit match bonus up to $100. Use it on best ball, pick them. Doesn't matter to us. You get 100 bucks if you deposit 100 bucks. So, Jake, any pick them stand out to you for UFC 300 over on Underdog? I think the Algemeine Sterling over 60 and a half significant strikes is pretty good. Um, I think he's going to have a hard time engaging in a ton of wrestling here against Cater in the 91% takedown defense. And Cater owns the dubious honors of the most significant strikes ever absorbed in a UFC fight was against him. There you go. Sterling, what, what was the number you got there? Uh, it's 60 and a half on underdog. 60 and a half for Aljo. Over there on underdog for significant strikes. All right, now let's talk about the fight that you have to target in DFS. Obviously, we have talked about the main events. They seem very likely. Uh, we got Oliveira Sarukian. We got Prohaska and Rockets. We got, what else we got? Moicano and Turner. Lots of options here, Jake. Which one are you denoting as the one that we have to target in DFS? Whoever wins is likely to score extremely well. Yeah, tons of options. Uh, I do think it's the Turner Moicano here. I think either Turner finishes him in like the first round and a half or else fades and Moicano either subs them or wins the decision. So like Jalen Turner, 100% finishing rate. It, it just, you know, it makes sense. Like the, the only way the fight busts is if that trend no longer continues, I think. Fair enough. All right. And before we close out with our stream parlay, because this is such an important card, Jake, I'm springing this on you. We're going to go fight by fight. One sentence. I'm going to ask you the X factor that's going to determine the outcome of the fight. People can use that however they want for betting or DFS. So we'll start with the first fight of the night. It's the last fight of the night. One sentence or a word, however you just define it. X factor for each fight. I'll start one by one. We'll make this quick. Real quick, hit him out, knock him out. Uh, Figueredo and Garbrandt. Uh, does Cody still have no chin whatsoever? Seems like the answer is very clear there. All right, Bobby Green and Jim Miller. Did Bobby Green come back too fast four months after that violent, crazy, criminal, late stoppage knockout? Uh, Marina Rodriguez, Jessica Andrade. I mean, I think that's interesting. Is Andraj going to run headfirst into an elbow or a knee from Rodriguez? Because we have seen her struggle against taller, longer fighters who want to counter strike. I'm loving this game. This is great. Uh, Turner and Moicano, you just mentioned it really quickly, but just summarize again one sentence, the X factor here. Is it, is it Turner's gas tank? I think it's over, under on Moicano, 15 point IQ. <laughs> that is very fair. Uh, Lopez and Yusuf. We, we talked about this fight briefly, but what would you say the, the true X factor is here? Let's see how Lopez's chin is. Hasn't really been tested. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Uh, Harrison and home. Is it just as much as Harrison's weight cut? Holmes take down the fence. I think that pretty much sums it up, man. Is, is home too old for this game anymore? And can she keep the fight standing? Look at me. I know a little bit about these fights, too, guys. All right. Aljo and Calvin Cater. Can Aljo force this into a grappling battle? And how does Cater look after a year and a half away following the ACL tear? Speaking of years away from an ACL tear, Alexander Rakic, Yuri Prohaska. I got to say, when I first thought of this fight, and I am – Yuri, he just, like, he lives in my nightmares, right? I can never get this guy correct. <laughs> I thought he should have been favorite upon initial glance, but as I told you, it seems like he has one path to victory, and that is an early KO or just a KO in general. Uh, so what is the X factor in your mind for Rockets and for Haska? Well, you're not the only one because he flipped to the favorite today. But um, Boom. <laughs> there you go. I think similar to the Moicano fight, like, is Rockets as dumb as we think he is, or is he even dumber? Is he going to look <laughs> to get the fight to the ground? You would think one would think. However, we've seen many times that is not the case. All right, Bo Nickel, Cody Brundage. Uh, we didn't even talk about Nickel in, uh, I forgot completely because he's such a massive favorite, has seven seconds of octagon time. Bo Nickel, Cody Brundage. 
Obviously, the UFC wants to build up Bo Nickel here. I think everyone can agree he is not deserving of the biggest favorite ever in the world in UFC. Uh, yet, here we are. And Nickel and Brundage, we know Brundage is A, a quitter, B, a gasser. Fantastic <laughs> attributes if you're looking to play against someone who's a minus 2,500 <laughs> favorite. What is the X factor here? Can Brundage test them a little bit? Yeah, I mean, can he test the cardio and chin of Bo Nickel? Because we have so many questions and haven't gotten any answers yet on Bo Nickel. But it does seem like a setup spot for Brundage to die. <laughs> I, honestly, I just want to see it extended a little bit, right? I just want to see Nickel yeah. just test it a little bit, dude. All right. Uh, and finally, we got just Sarukian and Oliveira. Uh, I know I got the Oliveira gloves here, but I think it's a Sarukian fight. But X Factor here. Can uh, can Oliveira crack him? Can he catch him in a submission? Seems like that's the answer, right? Can I finally get a Charles Oliveira fight right? You're on Saruki. So you're, so you're on. Okay. Oh god. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, got some gloves for you when uh, when Oliveira finishes. <laughs> oh god. I saw you brought those out. <laughs> I, I had to. I had to for UFC 300. So, all right, guys, that'll do it. We're gonna close it out now with our stream parlay of the week. Uh, Typically in these spots, whenever we see the Occupy model ranking a under an underdog over the favorite, I'm going to play them heavier in DFS. Typically, I'm going to bet them on the money line as well. Uh, and probably most importantly, I'm going to use them as my leg of the stream parlay. So I'm going to go Jamal Hill by KO. Uh, he ranks a little bit higher than Pareda in our model. So Hill by KO, that is my side. The parlay, Jake, what are you going to pair it with? Yeah, just to follow up on that last Oliveira note, I'm going to go Armand Sarukian, KO at plus 155. What could go wrong? Uh, we parlay those together. It's plus 665. All right. We were looking for a Lambo. Someone in Discord asked if it's going to be a Lambo parlay this week. Uh, but, Jacob, as we said at the top of the show, ownership is going to be pretty spot on. Not going to be any surprises, I would think. Nobody's going to fly under the radar because there are known quantities. And as a result, most of the betting lines are pretty sharp, right? So you really have to make some stands and, and, and take some reads, make some reads in order to, to find bets you like, right? Yeah, it's definitely tricky, man. Like I wanted to give the people a Lambo parlay. I was looking at some like round and method props and just seemed like if we want to lay money on fire, sure, we can go Hill round two KO, Sarukian round two KO, figure eight or round two KO at a billion to one. All right, so if you guys want that, you can certainly go bet that parlay that Jake just laid out. If you want actual Lambo parlays, I Honestly, just tune in next week or the next Apex card. We'll have a one that we don't have to force. So make sure you tune in every single week. Subscribing on YouTube is the best way to do that. It's free to do so. You'll get notified when we go live or upload these videos every Friday or Saturday. It's either a Friday night pre-recorded, Saturday live stream, whenever there are 12 fights or more on a UFC card. So for Jake at MMADFS.com, uh, I am Brian, OccupyFantasy.com. Jake, let's close it out with a bold prediction. UFC 300 was the craziest thing that we're going to see. I think we're going to see fighter below 13% get a finish. So Jan Shaunan, I like it. Or Holly Holm. <laughs> or, or Rodriguez. Or Rodriguez. Okay, I like that one. And no one's going to play Rodriguez at the same price as Andraj as an underdog, right? So that's, I mean, she's going to be 6%. She's a good play. So when she scores 57 points, come back here. Don't forget who told you. So <laughs> that'll do it. Jake and Brian, we appreciate you as always. Most importantly, go enjoy UFC 300.